Okay, thank you for your patience. Um, tonight's guest speaker is Ted Floyd. Ted is the editor of Birding Magazine, the award winning flagship publication, the American Birding Association. He's written five bird books, including the Smithsonian Field Guide to the Birds of North America and How to Know the Birds. Ted is also the author of more than 200 popular articles technical papers and book chapters on birds and nature. He's especially interested in analyzing bird vocalizations, in interpreting birds and nature for children and beginners, and in applying new media and emerging technologies toward the appreciation of nature. A graduate of Princeton University, an AD, and Penn State University with a PhD, Ted has taught biology, math, and statistics to everyone from second graders to advanced graduate students. He and his family live in Lafayette, Colorado. Please join me in welcoming Ted Floyd. Okay, the moment of truth am I audible? I'm here. Uh, uh, first of all, John, thank you very much, and thank you all for being out here. You know, we have up to 25 people. 25 people, and it's a lot of Zoomers. Uh, so I'm really gratified by the uh, turnout on this freezing cold night. It's so cold out there, it's been the whole night. Yeah. yeah. Before we get underway, I wanted to issue two special um, welcomes uh, to all of you all this evening. The first is from the American Birding Association. It's been my lifeblood and life story for on to like half my life right now, much more than half my professional life. And the American Birding Association has brought some swag for you all. On that table back here, I see some of you all picked up magazines. And also, you don't want to forget about your bird of the year stickers. These can be like, you know, on off on eBay for substantially for ordinary worth. Um, and uh, I think there used to be some luggage tags back there. Uh, Hannah Floyd, who's directly behind me there, can assist you with procuring magazines if you need just pick them up and take them away with you. But we would love for all of those to go to you all to have this not complain about this evening. So please take magazines and there are multiple versions of them. And by the way, that January burning cover is beautiful. It's an astonishing piece of sort of ecological art that I've ever seen. If you don't have this yet, you really want to grab this. It's an amazing piece of art. We're gonna be talking about this in art museums like decades from now. You gotta catch the spectrogram on there. That's uh, cool. All right, cool. All right, yes, sir. Oh, to this microphone. Excellent. Like right here. Okay. Am I good? Is this a visual problem or an auditory problem? Auditory. 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 Aha. Okay. I'm in front of the uh, of the eye in uh, 2001. Brain scanning me right now. Um, I had a second hello. I'm trying to remember what my second hello was all about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. Uh, my special sort of second or welcome or hello or something. It's to the folks who are on Zoom. And John already mentioned um, earlier on, perhaps before everybody had zoomed in, that we're in this funny um, hybrid situation here. So, you know, I'm in this, you know, physical space with the gathered minions out here, but uh, millions. And, you know, all the folks who are here with me in real life today. But I know that there are those of you all who are on Zoom as well. I don't have any way of, like, plugging into the, the hive mind or something like that. I know you all are out there in Zoom land, but I can't see you. I can't feel you. I can't hear you. So um, I guess and I'm sort of um, just carrying on what John said a moment here ago. Uh, be, of course, I'm not, not aggressive, uh, but be, be, be involved. Be, uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, shout out the questions, do a chat, something like that. And by the way, a chat, very good. Do, do a chat, because I'd love to engage the uh, Zoom people as well as we go along here. So bear with me. Um, it's awkward enough giving a talk to one audience with two totally different audiences in completely different venues. I'll try to take mine. So anyhow, um, with that out of the way, let's get underway with this evening's presentation. John told me that I have about three hours and 45 minutes tonight, and I'll try to keep my remarks to under three hours, but um, I expect for us to be done before uh, the clock strikes midnight. I'm just joking. We'll try to move through things, through, uh, through things here pretty quickly this evening. In fact, I am going to go sort of 
quickly. Um, and my style is that if you just want to sort of shout out a question or raise the hand, I, I'd actually shout out the question because I sometimes doesn't want you to see the hands raised up. You know, just request for clarity as we go along. That's totally fine with me. Uh, John, I think we also have time for questions and answers at the end if we've got by midnight. So uh, that's my style. You all can ask questions as we go along. So it looks as if I'm going to be talking about um, stealth birds this uh, evening. And uh, thanks again to uh, Fort Gonzaga Bunker for uh, bringing me along and encouraging me to talk about this. Is Jesse still Jesse? There's Jesse. Jesse, this is Jesse's idea, by the way. I don't know if you remember this, Jesse, but we talked about some topics. So I talk about, you didn't call them stealth birds, but this is all Jesse's idea. So if you like this, you know, it's all me. And if you don't like it, talk to Jesse about it uh, afterwards. But we're going to be talking about stealth birds. What the real thing we're going to be talking about is discovering wonder and amazement in our parks patches, and backyards. And we do so by means of a question. A question that I think every single one of us as a bird and nature lover ponders quite often, maybe every single day, practically every single hour in some of our cases. It's a question that even if we don't ponder it for whatever reason is inside ourselves, we get asked this question. Oh, I've been asked this question several times in the past couple of weeks. I was at a Christmas bird count less than a week ago, and uh, we had a reporter embedded in my group, and the reporter asked sort of the standard issue questions. Um, what do scientists do with Christmas bird count data? What population, bird populations of the Denver metro region are increasing and decreasing? And you all know, kind of like prepared for this question. I know the answers to these questions. And then the question that even though I've been getting it for 45 years, it always kind of catches me off guard, which is, like, why did you people wake up in the middle of the night to go bird watching and you're still here at noon and you're gonna be still doing this after dinner tonight? Like, why do you watch birds? All right, a couple of days after that, Christmas happened and then it was the period between Christmas and New Year's. I was on the phone with another reporter. I was playing this with our Colorado Public Radio. I should have known it was coming. The questions about, um, oh gosh, how to get started as a bird watcher, uh, what books and apps to own, uh, how to use your binocular. And why do people watch birds? <laughs> I get this question so often, and I have to confess, I've been bird watching for almost 45 years now. I still don't really have a satisfactory answer to the question. But that's the question that we're going to be exploring together this evening. So, why do we watch birds? I want to very quickly, I'm talking about like in a matter of a minute or two, acknowledge one major reason for which we engage birds, but that's not what I'm going to be talking about this evening. I do want to at least acknowledge that this is a really, really important question and or, or very, very important answer. And this is an answer that to me is, it's really interesting, but it's not what I'm about this evening. It's an answer that is extrinsic to the birds themselves. It's not really about birds. It's sort of more about ourselves. So why do we watch birds? Uh, one answer, and I see like Lauren Benedict, and Tom Schultz and others of the audience here is that uh, we're scientists and, and birds um, help to inform our understanding of of the universe, so the material universe all around us. Birds are model systems for understanding something like evolution or, uh, or anatomy. It's a great reason, but it's not what I'm going to see at all. Um, how about the value of birds for conservation? Maybe your um, what, what drives you is protecting habitats and the birds and, and birds. Sorry, habitats and the organisms. Birds are such a marvelous way for understanding what's going on in the world around us. You know about the old canary in the coal mine, and that's truer than ever today. We know that birds, perhaps more than any other major group of organism, respond incredibly quickly to a changing climate. If you do something to the earth, birds tend to track that change very, very quickly. So birds are really, really useful for conservation biology, but that's not the reason I'm going to talk about either. How about moving away from science and conservation to the realms of uh, poetry, and music, and the visual arts? Uh, for as long as humans have been humans, birds have inspired our artistic impulses. Birds are really, really useful in a sort of commodity way for inspiring the arts. But that's not what I want to talk about either. All right, one more sort of extrinsic reason that a whole bunch of us watch birds, it's one that really, really has attracted a lot more attention to just the past few years since the beginning of the pandemic, is that birds are they're good for us. When we get outside and watch birds, whether we're by ourselves or with other people, this has demonstrable, proven benefits for our heads and our bodies and perhaps our spirits as well. 
I'm thinking in particular of a friend of mine, Holly Merker. I heard her name bandied about here earlier today, who in an upcoming issue of Birding Magazine, published by the American Birding Association, has marshaled some really, really impressive evidence from the biomedical research sphere on how watching birds is really good for you. This is like not some hokey pokey, hocus pocus, pie in the sky, new age stuff that they do down there in Boulder. This is like legit, real <laughs> science about how good birds are. But all of that is not what I'm going to be talking about this evening at all. But I did want to acknowledge that those are some really good reasons for watching birds. No, what we're going to be talking about this evening are the intrinsic qualities about the birds. This isn't going to be about ourselves so much as it's going to be about the birds themselves. Like, what is it about birds that are so awesome? And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of our time this evening doing. But I'm also going to do this in two parts. The first part is going to go really, really, really fast. And then we're going to get into my comments for this evening. So I'm going to first look at what it is that makes birds so transparently, obviously, self-evidently awesome. Just you look at a bird and it's just the most amazing thing. And John, here comes a moment of truth. I'm going to try to advance a slide. Um, goodness gracious. Try this. Woo! All right, that's the bird up there. All right. Progress, folks. This actually works. We're looking here at a broad-tailed hummingbird, a beautiful broad-tailed hummingbird. It's red and green. This thing looks like it should go on the top of a Christmas tree or something like that. Speaking of Christmas trees, how do we really take down the Christmas tree in our living room? But we'll do that on some other day, won't we? Birds like broad-tailed hummingbirds, which, by the way, are common, even locally abundant in uh, Boulder County and certainly up here in Larimer County as well in Foothills Mountains, are just whoppingly, obviously, blatantly, transparently beautiful. But in addition to the physical or visual beauty of birds, how about their sounds? This is, of course, a western metal lark belting its uh, head off. I um, have heard in my life easily hundreds of thousands of individual songs of western metal larks, and every single time it stops me in my track. If you do the math, if you stop in your track 100,000 times, means that I have lived a rather distracted life. <laughs> Um, in addition to the beautiful songs that birds sing, how about their incredible behaviors? This bird is, of course, an American dipper. You know, I've seen so many dippers. That's one of the blessings of living in Colorado. I have never had the experience of just walking away from a dipper. If a dipper stays with me for a minute, I'm there with a minute. If a dipper for a minute, it's there for half an hour, I'm there for half an hour. If it's there for three hours, I get really cold watching the American dipper, like I did this one here. There's just so much to say about the transparent awesomeness of the American Dipper. I remember this photo was way up in the Wild Basin area of Rocky Mountain National Park on a brutally cold day in um, January. We just found a little bit of open water up there. The water temperature there is definitely below freezing, below zero Celsius because, you know, the, the, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the solutes in the water here in Colorado brings the water temperature down below freezing. This bird, which, anybody know how much Dipper weighs? Just curious. They weigh less than two grams. Oh, sorry, two, two ounces, two ounces, sorry. They weigh less than two ounces. They don't weigh less than two grams. Less than two ounces. They're about like uh, 70 grams. I mean, they were so incredibly tiny. If you ate like 10 dippers a day for your whole life, you would starve because it wouldn't be nearly <laughs> enough food. Dippers are so small and they throw themselves into this icy cold water. They can see underwater. They walk underwater. They swim underwater. They find food underwater. They can swim upside down. They can go up and down, sort of like a terrier jet or something like that. They come right back up, they eat it, they go right back down. They do it like for hours on end. Uh, there's incredibly round. This is a marvelous example of the uh, maximizing of surface volume, to, uh, surface area to volume ratio to keep your uh, heat inside your cell as opposed to letting it go out. And you know, you, as you can tell, I could talk all night about dippers, but I'm not going to talk all night about dippers because in addition to the colors and the sounds and the behaviors, there are the stirring migrations of birds as well. Maybe it's bird migration more than anything else that I think stirs and inspires us. This is a uh, long-billed curlew that was flying low over the houses, uh, flying uh, due north in uh, this past April in uh, the Park Hill area of, um, of Denver. If um, Helen Butts is out there, I think it was like almost flying straight over your house, actually. But this is a, a long-billed curlew on its northward migration. And you see something like this. And this is a bigger bird, but the distances that these birds, in particular, these sandpipers, Traverse is just staggering and awe inspiring and just so stirring the migrations. And finally, with birds like the prairie falcon, how about the majesty, the might, the, just the, the awesomeness of something like a prairie falcon barreling straight at you as this one's doing here? I know this image looks like it came from the steps of Central Asia, and I'd love to be able to tell you that's the case. 
This was actually at a busy intersection on 287 near Denver um, a couple of winters ago. But isn't that what's so cool about birds? So that like something like this amazing prairie falcon was just flying straight across 287, not too far from Denver on a winter day, not all that long ago. Sorry, did I get it wrong? 287, US 287? I'll say a lot of long days before. Uh, Okay, so I think it's a blank slide right now. And again, I'll mention this to all of you all, especially consumers. Um, technology being what it is, um, I can't see my next slide, and that's a real crutch for a presenter. So I also sort of have to guess what comes next here, but uh, that's the nature of the beast. And if I totally misanticipate the next image, so it goes. So what we're going to be doing now, let me stop for a moment, is getting into the real part of my presentation. So then this is the real deal now. All that was just preamble. We've talked about these extrinsic reasons for which people watch birds, these intrinsic qualities of birds, their incredible colors, their incredible sounds, their incredible behaviors, their stirring migrations, just their power and majesty and might in the case of that prairie falcon. These things that to me, again, are obvious, they're overt, they're blatant, they're transparent, they're so obvious. And there are birds everywhere on earth, more than any other group, and sorry, Tom, more than insects. Birds are more widely distributed on this planet than any other thing that you can, don't need a microscope to see. There are birds everywhere. There are northern fulmars at the North Pole. There are also northern fulmars like out, way out in the ocean, occasionally in inland. There are birds absolutely everywhere. And they're also so often, so as I said, transparently, so blatantly, so self-evidently awesome. But I'm gonna invert all of that now to talk about the kind of bird that is out there and just goes about its business, does its thing, and you could go a whole lifetime without ever knowing that the bird is out there. And I'm going to spare you all the philosophy and the metaphysics. I'm just going to let the birds speak for themselves here. I'm going to show you, I think I have five pictures here of birds that are all images from Boulder County, Colorado. They all occur up here in Larimer County as well. And I just want to share with you all five anecdotes that I think will get at where I'm going with all this. So here comes Anecdote number one, I was with Hannah not all that long ago, and we were uh, up in the woods, and um, somebody noted that we're taking a picture of a bird. Here, I'll show you a picture of this bird. Right? A bird that looked like this. It's a pygmy nuthatch. And the person asked me this question. So like, well, what is that bird? I said, oh, it's called a pygmy nuthatch. And the person said, really? I, I never heard of that bird. I had no idea that there were pygmy nuthatches up here. I've been coming up into these woods here for my whole life, and this person was my age older, I've never seen or heard of pygmy nuthatch. I'm thinking to myself, you've actually heard as many pygmy nuthatches up here in your life as I've heard Western meadowlarks in my life. You cannot go into the pine woods, which is where this happened, that sort of 6,000 to 9,000 foot belt front range, and not hear pygmy nuthatches that beep, 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 beep. I mean, these go on and on and on and on. And yet, I, I kind of get it. They're tiny. These birds are so small. They're way up in the tops of the ponderosa pines, and it's kind of mind their business out there. They don't really come down low very often. They're just going peep, peep, peep. And by the way, Lauren, I know that they sing, um, antif uh, not antif they duet, which is a really, really cool result that Lauren and her students have figured out. Um, they do so many amazing things. I didn't know, by the way, that they were a female, female to anything like that at all. But the average person with eyes and ears as good as yours or mine, heart and brain as good as yours and mine, world experience as good as yours and mine, can go to the pine woods for decades and hear this bird every single time they're there, have no idea that the big hatch is up there. All right, anecdote number two involves this bird. Now, this is obviously a hummingbird of some sort. Um, not fully clear yet what hummingbird this is. Now, a hummingbird, unlike a nuthatch, is a bird that attracts attention. If there's a hummingbird in your garden, you'll probably notice a hummingbird. I want to tell a little story about this particular hummingbird, not this individual species. Involves a name probably known to some of you all. I don't think he's here. I don't think I saw him on Zoom either. But uh, long, long ago, 15, actually about 17 years ago, Bill Schmoker and I were down at Pella Crossing in Boulder County talking about the fact that at the time, neither of, of us had ever seen in, the, in Boulder County a black chinned hummingbird. At the time, we'd never seen a black chinned hummingbird. We thought, oh, eventually we'll see a black chinned hummingbird because they're starting to show up in Boulder County. We also talked about the fact that maybe they would actually start breeding in Boulder County before too long. But first, we had to see one. And I'm not lying. Bill were here, he would attest this. While we were having this conversation, I can't even remember if it was Bill or me, someone said, oh, look, there goes a black chin hummingbird. So 
<laughs> the county bird for both of us. About 30 seconds later, oh, we lost the bird. It went off into like a little grove or something. About 30 seconds later, it reappeared with a mouthful of a cottonwood seed. But what crap, it's nesting. Keep an eye on that bird. It flew over to a tiny little nest, the crotch of a cottonwood. It was the first breeding record ever for Boulder County. Um, so we went in a span of 60 seconds from never having seen a, bold, a black chin hummingbird in Boulder County to having established at the time the first breeding record of black chin hummingbird for the county. It's a little wonderful little bit of sort of discovery for ourselves there. Black chin hummingbirds now are common in the eastern part of Boulder County, where I live. So not up in the foothills, but actually out in the plains, so to speak, getting out towards Well County. They're certainly up here in Larimer as well. Um, Greg, I know we used to see them up the, up the ranch back in our Wyoming days, and they're up by Casper. They're really, really moving northward quickly. The black chin hummingbird is a bird that was not here. I'm sorry, when I say here, I mean Boulder County, but also certainly not here in Larimer either when I got here 22 years ago. It's all over the place now. It's a classic stealth bird. This is not a showy, aggressive, in-your-face hummingbird like our Celastrus hummingbird, the broad-tailed calliope, the other uh, the ones that really are colorful and bright. A lot of them actually kind of look like this rather beautiful, but uh, shall we say subtly marked. Uh, this is definitely a hatchier bird, a hatchier female. Yeah, sure. And it's a hatchier bird, and it's not aggressive at all. Really, really cool that birds like black chin hummingbirds are out there. Again, clearly a hummingbird, but how many of us know really that this is Hummingbird. Anecdote number three involves this bird and this story. All right. If you bird watch a lot, especially if you do so at night, eventually you'll have an encounter like this one. I have to set the set stage here first. Long ago, about 20 years ago now, when I uh, very young people were coming into my life, uh, I had to uh, sometimes wake up in the middle of the night with them and try to get them back to sleep. Uh, my daughter um, was relatively straightforward. All she wanted to do was be read to or sung to or play a game or something like that. I think some of you all know my son. He's probably on a bike in Alaska now or something like that right now. He's not that sort of person. He had to be taken outside in the middle of the night because that's his thing. He goes outside. So it's like always outside. And we had yet another encounter with law enforcement. And this time I decided I'm just going to tell the truth. Officer, we're out here making recordings of and documenting the midsummer nocturnal wolf migration of tripping sparrows on their way from the Colorado. Actually, I think we use the scientific name of the Spizella Americana. Where's Nick? Spizella. But whatever. Making their move away east from the Rockies, west out to as yet unknown molting grounds in Oklahoma. And the guy was like, y'all have to do it. Like, he didn't even want to deal with this. It was like me and a seven month old documenting the midst of nocturnal migration of chipping sparrows. So let me tell y'all this is a chipping sparrow. It's an incredibly straightforward or basic bird. It's easy to identify. We all know the chipping sparrow. But 20 years ago, we didn't know about this incredible secret that the chipping sparrows in Colorado were harboring. So, what happens in around late June into early July in Colorado is that chipping sparrows disappear from the mountains. Nobody knew where they go. They just disappear. And then suddenly they were like kind of reappear on fall migration, like in September or October. But where were they in July and August? And I know some of you all know this story, but I imagine some of you all don't know the story either. What happens is that there's not enough food on the breeding grounds for them to raise a second brood the way that they do, for example, much of Eastern North America. So they have to leave. They have to get off the breeding grounds altogether and fly to places that are really safe for them to molt. Chipping stars have to molt in the summer as well. And they do this all at night. They fly from the Rocky Mountains where they've just finished raising, raising their young. They fly by night straight east across the plains. And then some of them wind up in far eastern Colorado, but also like Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle, uh, Kansas, Nebraska. And they complete a molt there that was not known about at all. And the only way that we can actually observe this is to go out in the middle of the night, going out with seven month olds is fine, but you don't have to do that, and listen for their tiny little flight calls. You can actually hear this straight east vector of the birds going out of the mountains, going right over the Denver metro region, and then winding up somewhere out near Oklahoma or Kansas the next morning. Nobody knew anything about this. If you go out at night, if you can still hear them, I can't hear them very well. You will hear them in tremendous abundance in the middle of the summer. So we know that birds fly north in the spring, south in the winter, but chipping sparrows have a third migration. They fly east 
in the middle of the summer from the mountains to the plains, which is just the coolest thing. Um, I remember an experience uh, years ago, I back right, sort of figured all this out. We were at um, Coors Field. You remember the Rocky thing? Rocky's still around out there. But, you know, we were at a night game, and we could hear the chipping sparrows going over at night. Um, right over Coors Field, and we got to see them in the lights. And that was just the coolest thing to be at a baseball game at about 10 p.m. or whenever it was at, maybe at the end of the day, and hear the chipping sparrows flying over in the middle of the night. Who knew the common, ordinary chipping sparrow forms this really stirring migration eastward in the middle of the summer to go to molting grounds that nobody had known about? I think our next bird, and I saw Craig Beckman in the um, in the Zoom room, um, is one that will. Um, oh, it's wrong button. The Here we go. It's this bird. This is a red cross bill. Now, the anecdote I want to share here is a very hypothetical anecdote. This one didn't really happen. But this is a conversation between me and myself 35 years ago. So, as I look at this red cross bill, I'm talking to myself 35 years ago in 1989. Is that right? 1989. My 1989 self would have been able to say, well, that's a red cross bill. It's obviously not an adult male. It's a female, a young female, a young male. Like that's all that I would have known about this bird in the year 1989. And except for Craig, because I, I saw Craig's name in the Zoom rooms. So I'm really nervous here. None of us, except Craig maybe, would have been able to say anything else but that, but then that about this bird. That's all we knew about this. That cross bill, it's not a white wing cross bill, it has to be a red cross bill. That's my 1989 self. It's probably Craig's 1989 self. We know so much more now about these cross bills. Um, could this bird actually be a species that nobody had heard of in 1989? The Cassia crossbill. I can't really tell from this photo, can you? But you could if you listened to, to these birds. Now, we know because we heard this bird, we made recordings of it, that this is a crossbill called the Type 2 red crossbill. It's a really, really big bill. And it's, um, it's, it's so called flight calls. It's very, very distinctive. We, we can recognize it um, just by listening to it. We can also recognize it spectrographically. Uh, you know, the Zorro Z. You take the Zorro C and just rotate it uh, 90 degrees and put it on a computer output. That's exactly what this bird's vocalization looks like. To me, it's a, it's a, it's a very pounding down third. Q, 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 Q. If you hear that up in the pine woods, you're hearing a type two red crossbill. There are lots of types of red crossbills. There are type five here in Colorado, and type four, type three, and I don't know, like type 12 or something like that. There's another species of crossbill called the Cassia crossbill. I've lost track of what they're doing with the crossbills in Europe. There are so many more crossbills now than we knew about 35 years ago. We also are starting to learn about their fascinating ecology and anatomy as well. Uh, so the different crossbill types, because their bills are different sizes, are differentially suited to different forging on different types of pine cones. So this is what we call ponderosa pine type two red crossbill. It likes to feed on ponderosa pine cones, except over in Summit County, in Grand County, where there are no ponderosa pines, then they eat another kind of pine cone. So they quite go with the story, but it's part of the truth of the Red Cross bill complex. We knew some other really, really amazing things about them. Even though their bills look about the same to us on the outside, they're very different on the inside. If you make an acrylic implant with like dentist materials of the inside of the cross bill bill and compare it against the different cross bills, they're quite different. We have no chance of seeing that in the field, but we know that that's the case. Everything I've just shared with you is just brand new knowledge. We did not know this. 35 years ago. I don't think Craig even knew this 35 years ago, and the rest of us definitely didn't know this 35 years ago. It's just a red cross bill, and there's so much to say about this amazing red cross bill. One more anecdote. Well, that does work. I think I'm going to use that gizmo instead. One more anecdote. Well, here's a goose. Here's a true story from just a few days ago. It's a little joke, a little game that I sort of play with myself and with some of the folks who come out on these uh, beginning bird walks that I love to do. Uh, the first Sunday of every month down in Lafayette, I think some of you all have been on those bird walks with me. I encourage anybody to come along here. But we invariably see geese like this. And the question arises, what's this bird? Of course, the hands all go, oh, Canada goose, that was easy. Or Canadian goose, Canadian honker, it's all the same, it's all fine. Uh, this is not a Canada goose. This is, in fact, a cat goose. And Along the lines of my crossbill comments, I want to again sort of maybe go back to not even 35 years ago, but just 15 years ago and compare not just the, our, the state of our knowledge, but the state of the cackling goose in Colorado versus today. Real quickly, if you're wondering why this is a cackling goose, it's got that fairly stubby bill, the very steep forehead, the sort of thick, short neck. Uh, and you can't tell us all the image, but this is a small bird. 
as well. We know that this is the um, nominate uh, Gen Z I or Richardson's cackling goose, the most common cackling goose that we have in the Front Range metro region. But that's actually not the story I want to tell. This is the story I want to tell. 15 years ago, if we saw a cackling goose in the middle of the winter, we thought, oh, that's pretty cool. It's a cackling goose. In fact, I remember Nick might have been on that outing with me, actually. We did a um, one of those uh, Gullapalooza outings at Valmont Reservoir in the middle of the winter, and we saw one cackling goose. We got kind of excited about it. Christian Nunes had just moved to Colorado. And he was like, oh, that's pretty cool, a cackling goose. What? I mean, you can go out and see tens of thousands of cackling geese in the Front Range metro region right now. They are everywhere. Now, memories are funny. You know, we kind of compare today with yesterday and yesterday with the day before yesterday. We kind of forget about what things were like a long, long time ago. 15 years wasn't all that long ago. There are so many more cackling geese now. And here's what's going on. It is a fascinating and deeply disturbing story. This is why there's so many more cackling geese. Until recently, cackling geese migrated from the high Arctic where they breed far south to uh, southern New Mexico, uh, uh, West Texas, also northern Chihuahua, way down there. And there's not much food down there either. So overwinter mortality at cackling geese was extremely high until recently. A lot of them died on migration because they were flying so far. And then when they got to the wintering grounds, they died because there wasn't much food there. But there have been massive changes in agriculture the past 15 to 20 years in eastern Colorado, eastern Wyoming, Texas Panhandle, northeastern New Mexico, Kansas, and Nebraska. It's economically incredibly profitable, but it produces vast amounts of waste grain. And these geese have figured out these agricultural subsidies and are just going to town on them. They don't have to fly nearly as far as they used to, so they're not dying on migration because migration is really difficult and tends to kill you. And instead, they're short stopping here in Colorado, like out in Lamar and other places like that, and eating tremendous quantities of grain and not dying. Overwinter mortality in the populations of cackling geese that winter here in Colorado used to be close to 90% in populations, it's less than 5% now. Their numbers are just Daggling high. But that, that's weird. Here's the really wild part of the story. So then they go back up to the high Arctic. They, and these are not, you know, explain the names Canada and Cackling Geese are like mixed up because Canada Geese breed in the United States and Cackling Geese breed in Canada. But anyway, so they're way up there in the um, Canadian Arctic archipelago and they're eating everything they can find. They're eating the grass on the tundra. Now, grass is all things considered a fairly light colored reflective object. Uh, sunlight hits grass in the Arctic and it bounces the radiation back up to outer space. But the geese eat all the grass. And what that does is it darkens the tundra. It makes the uh, tundra much more um, absorbent and much, much more heat comes in. And remember three years ago when the Arctic caught on fire? Uh, it was considered to be the worst wildfire ever recorded anywhere. I know we get excited about wildfires in Colorado and California and the Pacific Northwest and so forth, but and I wasn't up there, but from what I gathered, the extent of those Arctic wildfires, it's the Arctic. It's like way up in the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic was on fire. It was caused in part, we believe, by cackling geese and also snow geese and some other birds that were up there, completely denuding the Arctic of all that light reflective vegetation, making the Arctic turn black with mud. Sunlight comes down, burns the peat, and once the peat starts burning, nothing stops it until it starts snowing again. It gets warmer and warmer, so we have this positive feedback loop down here with more and more geese coming back down here to eat grain, go back to the Arctic, eat everything, cause more fires. Well, that's a downer. Anyhow, we talk about uh, how our little actions can have consequences. Next time that you, and for that matter, I, uh, engage in um, dietary practices that are related to the um, production of waste grain in eastern Colorado, considering that you are causing the Arctic. It's an extraordinary, it really is an extraordinary story if somebody could still be the story. All right, we're going to shift gears now. Got to move along here to the second part of the remarks. One thing I'm a little worried about. One thing I wanted to deal with and acknowledge is the possibility that these remarks are coming from somebody, namely yours truly, who's been thinking about these things for a long, long time, who's been doing these things for a long, long time. And maybe this is sort of an unfair setup because I'm really addressing this from the perspective of somebody who honestly has been watching birds far longer than most people who have on average and who has also been blessed with a lot of education and experiences and knowledge about birds. But I want to disabuse you all of that idea now by 
contemplating the possibility, I think the very real reality <laughs> that anybody can do this. And I'm gonna do this on a personal note here by considering sort of who I was. I talked about this conversation 35 years ago, like so long time ago, but even farther back in time, 40 to almost 45 years ago, to look at how these sorts of I don't know, uh, engagements and interactions with really, really common birds, I think are accessible to every single one of us, including me when I was younger than anybody in this room. All right. Exactly one year, uh, one month ago, today's January 11th, right? On December 11th, we're starting from the quality of December 27th. Um, I saw this Carolina chicken in Frick Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this photo is from December 11th, 2023. Yeah. And the reason I want to share with you all this Carolina chicken is this is the bird that 40, almost more than 40 years ago, close to 45 years ago, 40 to 45 years ago, was a bird that excited me like none other. Here is the reason why. At that time, and you have to remember, I was a posturing teenager. I'm just a posturing man now, but at the time of the posturing teenager, everybody, quote unquote, knew that all of the chickadees at the east end of Pittsburgh were black-capped chickadees. They had all turned into Carolina chickadees at some point in the past 10 years. I don't really mean they turned into Carolina chickadees, but Carolina chickadees were moving northward and apparently pushing black-capped chickadees out. And I and a couple of other, um, at the time, quite young bird watchers, some of them might know names like that, Bob Mulder Hill, Nathan and Eric Hall, Mark Vanderben, uh, sort of simultaneously figured out that these were black capped chickadees. They were Carolina chickadees. I also need, need to make a um, definite um, acknowledgement here of a uh, older and wiser mentor, the late uh, Ken Parks at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History of Pittsburgh, uh, knew about this before any of us also knew about it. But he encouraged us to go out there and document the fact that all of the black capped chickadees were Carolina chickadees. And that was so exciting to me as just a kid to realize that. We had it all along. Chickadees in Pittsburgh weren't black capped chickadees. They were Carolina chickadees. And there were other birds like that, and we're in the 1980s here now, that inspired me so much for their ability just to surprise and wow me. Like, for example, the Eastern Screech Owl. Um, Greg, you might recognize that Screech Owl. This is not from, uh, yeah, I see some laughter over this. It's not from Pittsburgh. Um, this is a Screech Owl, Eastern Screech Owl, that was a part of the Pittsburgh Ranch for, for many, many years. But the Eastern Screech Owl was a bird that I could not believe existed in big parks in a big city back east, like owls in our city parks. How is that possible? And the wildest thing of all to me about Screech Owls was, you know, they're tiny birds, you'll never see them, but they don't sound like owls at all. They don't go, hoo, 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 they, they whistle. That's what, oh, are we okay? Oh, I just died. I was, oh, wow. Epiphany or something like that. It's exciting. Anyway, the screech owl, the eastern screech owl, was a bird that I just couldn't believe existed in city parks. I don't even want to tell you all about how many nights I spent in the park, kind of with these pinch me, I'm dreaming moments. Oh my gosh, there are actually owls in our city parks. A couple more anecdotes from long, long ago. Believe it or not, this bird, the common brackle. Now, this is a really, really, almost like it's an exceptional bird. Here's something I realized as a kid, and I still really marvel at. The common grackle, I know they're common in Denver. They're really common in Pittsburgh. From um, sort of mid-March, uh, oh, really into October, they're there every single day. If you're a Pittsburgher or a Western Pennsylvanian or anybody out east, you will hear hundreds of thousands of common grackles during the course of a lifetime. You'll see hundreds or probably thousands on many days. Common grackles are everywhere in Pittsburgh. And I think it would be very, very generous of me to say that even 1% of Pittsburghers know this. Any Pittsburgher with ordinary human hearing and eyesight, whether you're just commuting to work or I barely looking outside their proverbial kitchen window, will see a common grackle. And by the way, they're beautiful birds. I mean, that, that's a, like a tropical beauty. It's not a tropical bird, but, but come on, that's a stunning bird up there. And I think it's really generous to say that in Pittsburgh, or for that matter, in Denver in the 2020s, that even 1% of the people know that this bird, it's everywhere. This bird's in your yard, it's in your trees, it's in your garage. I'm joking about that. But this bird is everywhere. It's beautiful. And nobody knows that it's the common 
cackle. It's such a cool bird. Got one more piece. You know, there's this idea of the birding uh, culture that I, I kind of subscribe to, but I'm sort of a little skeptical. This is the idea of a, um, a spark, a bird that gets you going. You sort of encounter this bird, and you know that you've been transformed, transfigured forever. You're going to be a bird watcher for the rest of your life. I can't really point to a spark. Right? But this bird, the brown thrash, finds comes pretty close. I, I have vague memories of birds before my first encounters with brown thrashes way back in the summer of 1980s. It was like after sixth grade now. And I saw a bird in a little patch of um, shrubbery in a place in Virginia where we were vacationing at the time. And was able to match it to a picture in a bird book back home and realized it was a bird called the brown thrasher. And I, I still remember the sound it made. I'm not talking about the song, but just it had this like kind of clucking sound. And I couldn't believe there was a bird called a brown thrasher. I went back home and um, a lot of family were gathered and friends. Oh, I've seen it. I've seen the brown thrasher. <laughs> we'll be okay. And, I, and, and they, they, they didn't know what the brown thrasher was. That's really cool. Man. It's toxic. Like, I'm not too, but it's all right. But it, to me, it was just so cool that there was this bird, the brown thrasher, and, and completely, beautifully obvious. And it, I learned it sings an incredible song. It was a really obvious bird, and people didn't know about the brown thrasher. So wonderful that there are these beautiful birds out there that people don't even know about. Now, jerking us all over the place chronologically, we're going to stay geographically in the east, but I'm going to bring the events of um, last 10 minutes here, that first minute, all the way up to the present time. I want to look at a, a bird walk that I did in Pittsburgh in my old stomping ground. Just a month ago, one month ago, I happened to be in Pittsburgh, and I know some of these folks are in the audience here. So, um, so this is a picture of you all and me from uh, just um, a month ago. Um, and there's a there's this wonderful symmetry image here. There's a three fine-looking fellows on the uh, the right over there are um, Mark, Mike, uh, sorry, Mike, Mark, and Ted. We met each other as bird watchers in high school long, long ago. Uh, the three folks over there on the left are more recent acquaintances of mine. That's Frank and Bob Maya. And Adrian, I've known his parents there for 10 or 15 years. And my son, quite that. And then right in the middle, both the two people I can really, really want to talk about. So that's uh, Ezra, uh, and then here is Charlie. And I met them about 40 minutes earlier. So check this out. Mike, Mark, and Ted have known each other for 40 years. Adrian and uh, Frank and Ted have known each other for 14 years. Charlie and Ezra in the middle have known each other for 40 minutes. And it was as if we had known each other for a lifetime. We were total like birding and brothers. We could have been blood brothers if we still did things like that. We might as well have been friends for life. And I'm sorry, Charlie, but I remember I can't even say sorry, Charlie, but sorry, Charlie. It was really Ezra and I just talking about the sorts of things that he was noticing, the sorts of things he was discovering. Ezra, you put me on to something about chickpeas that I actually did not know about. Offline a little bit later, which I can't imagine. He's not somebody who needs to his attention here. But all of us, from Maya's age all the way up to me and Mike and Frank, uh, to me and uh, me and Mike and Mark, were just all brought together on a cold, kind of sleepy and dreary. Hitler days are always like that. But a day of wonder and amazement and discovery. And it was just so wonderful to be out there with people I don't get to see very often at all. And just to share in this wonder and amazement about, we didn't see a single really. Here. Not a single really rare bird the whole morning, but we really enjoyed so much time in wonder and sharing. We did, though, see one very, very special bird. Now, it's not a rare bird, but it's very, very special for me. And it was this bird. Well, it's a common raven, of course. Uh, I, by the way, this photo is not from Pittsburgh, but this is a perfectly common raven. And this is a bird, and I'm jerking this way back into the 1980s now, that back in the 1980s in Pittsburgh was unstable. This bird was so rare that you didn't even want to mention seeing a common raven. I saw a common raven like in the 1980s, and I just, I think that's what it says, you know, nobody would see what I see a common raven. The common ravens are all over the city right now. They're all moral right now. They're also common here. Right now. And, but the common raven for me is sort of so well exemplified in a photo like this. Again, like my prairie falcon from earlier, this could well be. I'm joking. This actually could be in the steppes of Central Asia because common ravens do occur on the steppes of Central Asia. But this is sort of the way that a raven is supposed to look 
But ravens never do what they're supposed to do. Raven is not in Frick Park giving a vocalization that I've never heard before. And I have spent so much time with common ravens. I'll never forget this sound. It's on the music phone. So, and it was Apparently, I don't not really into the set. I'm like the one from here, though. Um, apparently, um, there's a, a song by the Doors. It ends with do 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 do. Something like that. But, yeah, somebody. Said, I don't know anything about Doors, but yeah, really, really cool. Common raven here. Common ravens are just. I can't call them my favorite bird, but they're almost my favorite bird because you learn so much. We have access to common ravens every single day in the Boulder area. We do all the time here. Um, how much we really know about ravens. I'm going to show you all an image now of the very classic raven. I'm embarrassed to say that this common raven is a Walmart at the intersection of uh, 287 and Baseline Road in Lafayette. I go there to take pictures of ravens because ravens, in addition to you know haunting the steps of Central Asia, also hang out at Walmart. So this is a very typical raven here. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anybody to spot here, but I mean. If I ask you a question like, how do you identify Pokemon? How do you identify a raven? What color is it? Now, there's a bird called a Chihuahua raven. White, right. But the common raven is all black, right? We get the Google of you. Now, I know you're, you're, you're yeah, that is something I can't use. But here's the exact, I'm going to show you the exact same common raven now, just a second later. Check this out. Like, look at his eye. Now, wait a minute. Like, I know. Does this bird have avian flu? <laughs> no. I mean, actually, so one of the symptoms of avian flu is just kind of hazy to the eye. So this is a totally normal, healthy raven. So this is what's called the uh, nictitating membrane, the nictitans of the eye. Uh, birds like humans can um, wipe an eyelid up and down, but they also have another membrane called the nictitans, the nictitating membrane that kind of goes left and right, back and forth, like windshield wipers. And, um, all birds have this nictitan, and I started noticing this when I had a new when I began taking pictures of the dead human. It was lots and lots of corvids, and what I noticed was that crows, ravens, um, also the blackbirds, um, uh, oh, black-billed magpies, the nictitans were always blue. Let me show you why there's another image here. Red bird and this white. So isn't that cool? Then they go left to right, not up and down the way that our um, eyes do. I wonder if that blue was sort of just a um, an artifact of the blueness of the sky. It's even the it's grayest of days when there's no sunlight at all. I, I, no, um, no blue sky at all. It's just light up there. But the naked hands are still blue. So magpies, crows, ravens, common grackles, red green blackbirds, and some other birds have entirely blue naked hands. It's not just some iridescent effect. It's actually a Part of the bird. Now, I'm going to say something sort of extreme here. I'm a little bit nervous because I know there's some ornithologists and other scientists in the audience here, but I don't really think this was made until very, very recent for several reasons. We can't see this. You cannot see this just watching a bird in the field. It happens too quickly. It might get so fast. You talk about a blink of an eye, blink of the naked hands goes a lot faster. When we look at birds in museums, there's lots and lots of museums and lots of wonderful, incredibly educational studies about this. And, um, when we take the eye off the bird, right? That's one of those things we do when we prepare a bird to get rid of the eye. So we don't preserve the bird's eye by putting its naked hands here. And in general, in the type of photography that was done long, long ago, this is like much 50, 50 years ago, we didn't really want images like this at all. We wanted photos that we can then, because we film and things like this. But now we're documenting, because everybody, every one of us takes, you know, millions of digital photos. This colorful nictitans on birds like the common raven. I have not been able to find in the literature anything um, other than very, very sort of anecdotal, I think called data, just sort of, you know, speculations about the color of the nictitans of Corvids. We can go out and take pictures and see things like this, which to me is just so cool. All right, I have one last sort of um, array of images I wanted to show you all, and then we'll be done with this. So we moved the show all the way forward to today. I'm going to share with you all some images for today. Now, it was a cold and this morning cloudy and nasty, gnarly day. But um, I wanted to go bird watching and I go bird watching every day. It's a uh, personal discipline of mine. I actually used to go to the of bird watching every day. Um, great. Um,
On days like this, though, I say, you know, maybe there aren't many exciting birds out there, but maybe they're incredibly exciting to fight. And by the way, I should acknowledge that Hannah Floyd was with me for all of these birds to help me find them. This is an American robin. Well, no biggie, a robin. Come on, the robin's an incredible bird. It's up there with the raven. It's one of the most amazing birds. And by the way, today's January 11th. And how often do you hear from somebody, I think I saw a robin, but it's winter, so it couldn't be because the robin's all flying in Texas for the winter. No, there actually are robins in Colorado. We have robins in like Alaska, Newfoundland Park, so in Newfoundland during these winter months. There are robins everywhere. They're just such incredible birds. I don't have the time to give an entire talk on the robin, but I have actually given an entire talk on the American robin. It is one of the greatest of all of our birds. Uh, we also found a bird of a spotted toe. This is a female spotted toe here. She was feeding on the ground by a feeder. I mean, it's a big bird if you've never seen a bit of a toe. It's kind of worth looking at. Oh, it's gentle with a satanic red eye there. Maybe it's gentle and satanic. Uh, but it's a really, really beautiful bird down there in the uh, belief there. The Tony, by the way, is a kind of sparrow. Speaking of sparrows, we found a bird like this white crowned sparrow. Kind of obviously this is a white crowned sparrow. It's all medium crowns right there. But here's the cool thing about this white crowned sparrow. We can tell where this white crowned sparrow spent summer because of the absence of black in front of above the eye. It's like gray and white in front of the eye there. So this is a field mark that's consistent with birds that breed in Alaska, the gambles, white crowned sparrow. If you look at some of the really, really careful natural history literature from as recently as the 1960s in Colorado, uh, Edwin Waitiel, a famous nature writer, actually admits this. Um, there's this idea that the white crowned sparrows that breed in the Rockies come down to the foothills during the summer, during the winter. That's completely erroneous. The birds that breed in the foothills actually get down mostly to Mexico. And the birds that we have in the winter here come from Alaska where they bred during the summer months. And we can tell that this is an Alaskan breeding. I should probably say Western Canadian breeding, white crowned sparrow again, because they have gray or white in front of the eye there. Next time you're up in Rocky Mountain National Park in June, you can try this out yourselves. And you'll notice that the birds don't look like this one. Those are the ones that right now are in Mexico and will be coming back to our area in uh, May and June. And these are the ones that will be going back to Alaska from May. White crowned sparrow, but you're not going to believe what I'm going to do here. I'm going to end this off with probably the most prosaic bird. What, 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 what's the most ordinary bird I could possibly show you all? Exactly. I have some chills in the audience here. This is a house sparrow right here. Now, this is an awesome bird. And this is a really cool photograph. This took just a few hours ago here, but what you can do with this house sparrow here, and I don't know how well I'll show you the audience in the room with the little. Um, or of the rose, but you can see black feathers seemingly coming in on the grass here. So this is a house sparrow, it's a male that is in the prospect, I'm sorry, in the process of acquiring, let me use a technical term here, it's breeding plumage aspect. That is to say the way it looks during the breeding season. Now when we think of birds that get really brightly colored in the spring, birds like tanagers, uh, rose beaks, uh, loons, uh, gulls, um, they do so by means of a feather mold late winter and early spring. And they grow in new feathers and they become the beautiful like your tanager. Sparrows all what they do is fully genius. Now for the Western tanager you're growing new feathers. If you're a lively bunny you're growing new feathers. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, this is energy that can be used to raise young, this energy that can be used to migrate. House sparrow doesn't have to do this at all. What it does is it actually emotionally once a year, not twice a year, and it has on all the brightly colored breeding plumage aspect of feathers underneath the surface, and they wear down during the course of the nest. People are like, really, is this what you're talking about? This is actually how they do it. It saves an incredible amount of metabolic energy. And what you can see happening here is these feathers are beginning to appear underneath this external coat. This during the course of ordinary feather wear, it will wear down, no energy, no effort, no expenditure for the bird at all. And all of a sudden it wakes up one fine day in spring looking like a beautiful eating male house sparrow. And a house sparrow does something so incredibly ingenious like that. By the way, the European starling does the same thing, and a long spurs and um, snow bunnies do that as well. 
fairly uncommon a way of very efficiently, very um, energetically, economically uh, bringing in bright feathers without like spending or dotting the green ball energy. That's what this house is in the process of doing. But if you make that cool, what could be drabber than a somewhat reading English male house? A female, right. So here's a female house sparrow. This is actually the greatest bird I saw today. It's the greatest bird I'm going to be talking about all night long. We're almost done here. This is a female house sparrow here, the plainest bird on earth. It's actually phenomenal, that plain bird. What a kind of fun question. Tell us about wintery female dick sizzle. You don't have to answer that question right now. They're actually more similar to dick sizzles than you might imagine. Yeah, this is a female house sparrow here. And you know, doesn't she kind of look like she's sort of paying attention or listening? Right. So there's a male. Chirping next to her. Now, if you think a male getting the plumage to wear is cool, wait till you hear about what females do. So, the male's chirping. Can anybody do it, imitate a house girl chirp? Can you just come on, just do it? Come on, chirp, 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 chirp. Oh, right, over and over and over again. It's just this totally monotonous, steady chirp, 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 chirp. chirp. Sure. And all the field guides and all the reference books and all the scholars who work say the same thing, right? That word monotonous comes up over and over again. It's a monotonous chirp. It's the same chirp. It's just the same note repeated over and over again. Chirp, chirp, chirp. But that's not right. So a couple of years ago, a couple of us um, took the um, spectrograms of, of songs of um, elsewhere, and we noticed that they were incredibly complex. And we slowed them down by about... Um, 67% uh, by about two thirds. Remember, like uh, back in the day, you take those old, um, like uh, what, 33 records and played them at 78 or 78 down to 33. And remember, like, um, I think if you took one of the Beatles albums and turned it upside down, like uh, Jim Paul McCartney said, Oh, you can make John. Um, so you can do the same thing with a house barrel. If you slow down the song of a house barrel, it goes like this. <laughs> Remember in um, Star Trek IV, the voyage home, when they slow down the whale noise and it's just really beautiful sounding? The same thing with the house sparrow. The house sparrow sings an incredibly beautiful song, but our, it's not our ears that are incapable of hearing it, our brains are incapable of hearing it. The brain of the female house sparrow is simply superior to ours. It is able to, well, no, I mean, it, it really is. We, we cannot hear nearly as finely resolved um, differences in sound over very short periods of time as the female house sparrow can. An extraordinary example of this is a bird called the Henslow sparrow. The Henslow sparrow supposedly just goes, but it actually goes, and we see that spectrograph and we know that it's doing that. We can't hear it because our brains aren't good enough to hear it. But this house sparrow is in rapture. Is listening to this beautiful song being sung by her mate. I think that's so cool that this bird is doing something that we know about. We can see it spectrographically, and not a one of us will ever hear it. I know maybe after the singularity happens and we upload our brains and we'll be better or something like that. But as long as we're corporeal humans, we can't do that. All right, I have two final slides for you all. And after you went home, I'm sorry, but the sky is clear. And I did see um, two bald eagles up on a uh, nose there. Yeah, I know we finally have a kind of back to the beginning here. And that's sort of the whole point here. Folks, it's okay to look at a pair of bald eagles right up on a tree by Wanaka Lake in Bosnia. And birds like this are just amazing. I don't have to tell you any story about this bald eagle. I don't have to tell you anything about its behavior, anything about its mold, anything about its cryptic or secret or hidden lifestyle song. It's just an amazing bird to look at and bald eagles right overhead in Bosnia. So the final image for you, and I'm going to. Um, so this final image here is to sort of um, bring the whole human dimension back into all of this. I want to set the stage for you um, for this image before I actually share it with you all. So we're going to go back to the month of October. Something that happens up here in Fort Collins and also down in Boulder. And by the way, you guys get it about an hour before us. What happens in Fort Collins an hour before it happens? In, uh, maybe an hour and a half before it happens. Yes, somebody said Sand Hill Crane. This is a main event of the, and this is my son. This is something that happens every single year in October. And, you know, we live in trying times. You, know, you may have read the news and heard that there's some problems out there. 
full society. When the Sand Hill cranes go over the Front Range Metro region, right down the I-25 corridor, like all of humanity is united. People come outside, like the cranes are going over, the cranes are going over. Like, we're all brought together by the spectacle of these cranes. And these cranes are these are the amazing cranes. I, I, I want to be really careful. I might have some folks, some friends out in the, uh, the west of Colorado. And those are great cranes out there. The ones that come to the Carpenter Ranch and see those cranes when they go down to the um, Alamosa and head down to New Mexico. Those, those are really cool cranes. I absolutely commend to you the events that are out there in western Colorado, especially the uh, Crane Festival. But these are the cranes that just they get me every single time. Some of these sandhill cranes breed literally thousands of miles west of the Bering Strait, so far east that they're way out in the Eastern Hemisphere. They come all the way across, they come way across Alaska, all the way down the uh, east side of the Canadian Rockies. By the time they're in Colorado, they are on final approach to their wintering grounds, and they don't mess with us at all. They're just up there over I-25, and if you didn't know us, they never land. I mean, a few of them land, but they are just going. And we love these cranes like we love nothing else on earth. It brings all of us together. Everything that's amazing about birds are so obvious and they're so blatant and they're so just self-evidently beautiful. We love cranes, especially cranes and moons and other things like that. But the story of the cranes, the fact that they've come all the way from central Russia and are on their way to their final um, stopping grounds, you know, just up south of Colorado, actually, it's something that just, after all these years, still makes my spine shiver. It's an incredible story. So that's the note that I'm going to end on right here. But I'm also going to send you all out with like a, I feel like a picture or something, like a, a charge or a benediction or something. So we're, 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 we're in the know. We know how cool, how awesome, how self evidently wonderful birds are. But lots of people actually don't. And I hope I didn't come across as sort of snitty or snotty about the people who don't know what a um, common graph is. Or who wouldn't recognize the eastern screech owl that you hear or went to the garage or something? We have that knowledge. We've been struck, we've been touched, we've been affected for some reason by our love for birds. And birds like these cranes are like, they're really good for us. And I know how, and if Holly, you're out there, I know how birds, how good birds are for us individually. I think they're really, really good for us as a community, as a society as well. If everybody in the world is passionately committed. All of us in this room, and hello, Zoomers, as all of you all on Zoom are as well. I don't think there are many problems in the world at all because we'd all be silly as birds that like we would have any time to fight with ourselves. So, you all have been bitten by the birding bud, bug for whatever reason you've been touched. I don't want to go all spiritual on you all here, but like birds have affected your lives in an incredibly positive way. And I exhort all of you all to get out there and share with the whole rest of the world wonder and majesty and transparent awesomeness, but also secret and skeletal wonderful ways of birds. Thank you all very much. Good night. Can afford maybe 10 minutes for questions. Right. And I want to make sure that the Zoomers get in on this as well. So, um, uh, John, do you manage this? Or? Great. So, um, so, but I do want to say to the Zoomers out there, if you have a question, do me a favor or do John a favor too. Say who you are and where you're from. That's always um, of some interest to me. But we have a question in the room first. So, yes, what is your question? Get a chance to talk about bushes at all. So um, there's a picture of a bush tit there. That is very true. Um, I don't have anything to say about bush tits at all, except I do. The bush is my favorite bird. I, I just I can literally give a talk on. In fact, I've given a 90 minute talk on the bush tit. Nobody wants to leave at the end. That's how riveting bush tits are. The bush tit's the greatest bird in the world. It does so many incredibly stealthful things. Things that we're still learning about. I just didn't have time to put the bush tit to talk. But thank you for mentioning the bush tit. It's my favorite bird. It's the greatest bird. You'll guide, you'll have to bring me up here later. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else, either in the room or on Zoom? Yeah. yeah, sorry. I know this is very technical. Okay. Oh, God. okay no, no questions from the Zoom folks. Sorry, I covered everything. Looks like I'm getting home before midnight. Oh, no, there's a question. All right. 
So believe it or not, um, not much of a camera at all. It's the, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, you're thanking me. The question was, what kind of a camera do I use? So uh, most of these images were taken with just these little um, Canon FX70s, um, small enough that you could, the size of a dipper, it weighs a little bit more than a dipper, but about the size of a dipper. Um, today's digital cameras are just amazing. The SX70, which unfortunately isn't sold anymore, um, it's just a few hundred dollars. A Nikon has a, a really nice camera now called the, I think, 95. Say again. All right, thanks. It's a 950. In fact, and Nick, you were an inspiration without your knowing it to me to get that camera a few years ago. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's just a little digital camera. I want to say something about cameras real quickly here. Thanks for bringing that up. So, people always say, what kind of camera do you use? And uh, my friend Bill Schmoker, who I mentioned a little earlier, said, well, that's a little bit like saying to David Sibley, oh, those are great paintings. What kind of paintbrush do you use? Well, look, it's not the camera. It's the person. It really is. The equipment matters to some extent. But if you gave David Sibley a crayon, he'd still draw better fur than any of the rest of the guy would. I mean, he actually would. Um, it's about, it's kind of Canada's Chinese niche. It's just wait for the bird to come to you. Like, I know that's silly, incredibly basic mindset, but it's really, really good. Sit with the bird, know about the bird before you go out. Understand a little bit about the habits, and not only the species, but the particular bird as well. So the answer to the question is just a little throwaway digital camera that I've dropped too many times. Um, and by the way, if you want to get a really beautiful image, it's fantastic. You can get perfectly serviceable images of birds in this day and age, it's remarkably Okay, Danny, let me know who's wrong. What bird species does help their low energy mold status? Yeah, I don't know. So, by the way, and I may have blocked over this real quickly. For some, Charlie does. Um, I, I mentioned that the growth of the, 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 um, the bunting and the um, long spurs. Um, I, I don't know. It seems like an ingenious thing that a lot of birds should do. That's a good question for grad students. Okay. Tina would sent a photo taken last week of sandhill cranes in Delta County. Oh, right, yes. Where they supposed to be somewhere else. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a really interesting matter. So, this is going to be another one of these like 15 to 20 year differences. If you had been in Delta in Western Colorado 20 to 25 years ago, the dead of winter, there would have been no sand cranes there now. Sandhill cranes are doing the, um, the cat and goose thing now. Their shortstop is the Delta, and then the flock that's getting bigger and bigger there every winter. Just as our climate gets warmer and drier, and also there's a lot of agriculture up there, that's probably going to happen in the San Luis Valley you know, in our lifetimes and maybe even sooner. The birds are getting back earlier and earlier in the spring. The first arrivals now are in January, and the last returns in December. I mean, there's not much space between December uh, and, and January. So that's a recent phenomenon, and it reflects changing land use, it reflects uh, the warming, drying of the climate, and also. Um, and an increased population of cranes. A crane used to be persecuted. Nobody will be persecuted. Okay, I just, I, since that came up, I just want to mention something about cranes, which is pretty cool. So, um, cranes cannot be hunted in Colorado. So, at least that was the case as of a couple years ago. And there was a proposal to open up hunting cranes in Colorado. I think that's 10 or 15 years ago. And you know who just completed it? The people who just hunted cranes. Uh, there are a bunch of different. And nobody wants to snap people who kill cranes. So the hunting of sandhill cranes in Colorado is still a problem. Anybody else out there? Oh, and my microphone slide. This must, oh, wait, or maybe he turned off the microphone. That's good. For me. But anyhow, the microphone is dead. I'll take that as a signal from on high to uh, to stop talking. And again, thank you all and good night. Thank you all. Thank you, Sam. That was magnificent. Before you run out, just a note about next month's program. Um, our speaker next month will be Arvind Punjabi, Ooh, senior research scientist at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Arvind will be speaking on the topic of three billion birds lost and counting. Can we stop the decline and bring them back? So I hope you'll join us for our February program on the second Thursday. Thank you, Ted.